Hi, I'm Lauren. Welcome to Publisher Group Talks. The aim of the channel is to create a platform that lives up to a motto of Arrive Smart, Leave Smarter. We want to educate, inform and inspire creatives, regardless of where you are based in Cape Town, Johannesburg, Zurich, London. We want you to be inspired by our show. And today's studio guest is Danny Tirelli. Welcome, Danny. Hi. Nice to have you on the show. Nice to be here. Yeah. Just to give the audience a little bit of a background, um, Danny had, when he was studying, he had actually studied under me. I was his lecturer. And he, <laughs> a long time ago. A long time ago, yes. And that's how we became acquainted over that period. And we've, we've just stayed in touch over the years. And he did um, a first year graphic design course. And he wanted to work a little bit more in the design aspect because of his photography background. And that's kind of, at the time, I remember you talking a lot about the photography and you'd already been photographing for yeah. for quite a few years I before that. I worked in an advertising agency. Yes, yeah. and you wanted to get a little bit more of a background. That's where Both it started. Sides, yeah. And at the moment, Danny sits a few years later, fast forward a good couple yes. years, hey, at least 10. Yeah. Yes. And he's now a fashion photographer, an advertising photographer. Yeah. And he works for top brands, and he is probably one of the most amazing photographers. And it's not a biased. You, you just are one of the amazing, most amazing photographers that I have ever come across and worked with. Him. Thanks. <laughs> so, shame all those other photographers out there yeah, like, I'm amazing too. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes. Some, some listeners are not going to be happy. No, no, they're going to think it's a biased thing, but you really are. And you also, yes. not just that, is I think it's also the way that you work with clients because we deal with um one or two similar clients as mm. well that have worked with you. And it's your client relationships as well. Yeah. And also in that way of how you are definitely an entrepreneur and how you've developed this, I would say, business and your skill. And you took what is naturally your gift and you worked with a natural gift. And a lot of people don't work with their natural gifts. They often are like, oh, I've always wanted to be an artist. Oh, but I'm sitting behind this desk here at an agency, but I'm actually this amazing pastel artist and I'm not kind of going with my flow. Very hard to get there. So It is very hard to get to there. To be a bit obsessed I yeah. think, to get there. And driven. And driven, yeah. Ten years of hard labor to get to a point where you're doing it right. It's yeah. a, lot of, a lot to go through. Yeah, and it's a lot of sacrifice because of financially it. and emotionally. You have to eat too many noodles for about <laughs> nine years. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually very true. It is. Yeah, no, Actually, I know. A, a photographer once, when I started, he said to me, it's going to take 10 years. Me thinking, oh, you know, you're young and you and digital's come out. And no, it will be like two, three years and I'll be working. It is true. 10 years later, it takes about that. And those 10 years are not so much about the, the medium. It's about that, that maturity, I think, in exactly, the Exactly, and the connections and building and, and maturing connections and things to work out and people to trust you. Building trust takes a long time. Mm. For people to give you a huge budget of their money to spend and putting it all on one day that you're not going to mess up. It's quite a lot of trust involved. So it takes mm. years to build that up. And also client relationships. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I think, one of the most important things. Yeah. And that's often... I'm very um, good at retaining clients. Yes. That's what I Getting new say. clients is a different story, yes. but retaining clients, I think, is such an important It is. Because it's easy just to tell a client to F off. If you don't want to carry on with the work, it's harder to actually spend the time trying to understand what the client wants. Exactly, yeah. And, and dealing with all the things and getting what they want out of it and and delivering and being there on the hours late at night when they need something and stuff like that. It's all part of it and all important. I think the biggest mistake that creatives make um, and that also young creatives make is they think that working is from nine to five. Not in this industry. <laughs> Not in any sort of creative industry, I don't no. think. You gotta, yeah. You gotta do what you gotta do, and that's just that's why the people that are really obsessed and and are willing to put that in do well, and the people that don't get fed up or get angry with clients and just give up. And that's I think that's the difference. I think that the people that are obsessed and can't leave are the ones that do well, and the people that are that eventually just give up will be out. So the ten years weeds out all those people. Yeah, it does. I mean, you can give anybody a camera; it's what they do with it. Exactly. Yeah. What would you say is, so as I just said, you can give anyone a camera, it's what they do with that camera. Mm -hmm. It's about seeing that different shot in the camera. It's, a, it's about that. And I think there's a lot of people that have talent and stuff like in that area. But as you were saying earlier, it's also about the business side. And I think 20% of my job is actually photographing things. The rest of the time you're doing admin, keeping up with clients, 
not letting clients forget you, old clients, also um, yeah, doing marketing, admin, all that stuff, and the the post production, all that. So I think twenty percent of the time you're actually doing the actual shooting and the creative part. The rest of the time you're just managing a business. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And people like they don't think that that there's that side to it. They think it's just flying around the world and taking pictures of people and, you know, it's all... Looking glamorous. Looking glamorous. And people yeah. get into it because they want that and then they realize that it's, you know, 20% of that. And then, then I think that it, you realize and that's why the people that are obsessed and really want to do it and don't get in, in it for that. They get in it for 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 actually the producing this amazing work and the final product. They're the ones that stick around. Absolutely. And I know we've spoken a lot off camera over the years about um, aspects of the business side and even just the preparing for the shoot and what kind of goes into all of that. And, you and you know, as we had spoken about mm. a couple months back and you said nobody really talks about that stuff. No one, everyone talks about like, you know, use this F-stop and this aperture yes, it's all, it's all and it's all like the technical about aspects. About that 20% of the work. Exactly. I mean, no one talks about the rest. No, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the rest in this episode just to, because I know that the listeners out there are going to really benefit from that knowledge and it's almost that you, that digital mentor here, giving that information where you're like, guys, these things are really important and no one's thinking of them. No, what everyone we, just talks about the day. No one talks yeah. about the... The month before and the month after, and that's why I've actually started lecturing it at Orms to 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 go from they call it from brief to billboard because it really is that. It's not as you say. It's not just about the technical stuff on the day, and you can find that stuff anywhere online, and it's just pointless. The main things are you know the I do actually full production, so a lot of the time some photographers work with a production agency, and they will do half half of that side, but I do it all which is quite quite crazy and cumbersome. But, yeah, it's, it's the, obviously, it's getting what, you, what the client wants and understanding that and mood boarding and getting that, that everyone's on the same page is super important. Otherwise, all the creatives are going to go their own different direction because you're working with a team. It's not mm. just a photographer. It's just a stylist, makeup artist. Everyone has to be on the same page and everyone has to have the same sort of goal, end goal, creative goal. And it's it's about getting that across and getting what the client wants because sometimes the clients don't really know what they want. They kind of do, but you sort of have to push them in the right direction mm. to realize what they want. And then then after that, it's going through to organizing locations, organizing lighting, working out what type of lighting, going to the location, seeing what's going to work, coming back to the studio, working that all out in your head. In organizing the different people on the right team for the right job, that's also very important. Team is super important. And I think people just sort of get friends and stuff like that. And it's it's really, you got to choose. If you're doing menswear, you got to find someone who's really strong in menswear, not someone who does women's wear most of the time. And same with hair and makeup. So it's all about getting all those details right before the day so that the day goes smoothly. Mm. And that's what I say. Nobody talks about that. And also what you build to put in front of the camera is just as important of what you're doing with the camera and the lighting and the mm. gear. Mm. People also focus so much on the other side. Mm. But never like if you put something that's not great in front of the camera, you're not going to get, even if you, you know. How would you know it's not great though? Because I'm just kind of analyzing it myself and be like, oh, I don't know. How do I know it's not great? I think that's where the creative eye comes in. Okay. I think you need to have that eye and you need to have that. And I mean, she's, I don't, half the time, I don't know what's right or what's wrong. And you kind of just sort of feel it and try feel it out and look at references and try um, look at the reference and look at what you're doing and try and sort of match it and using multiple references, obviously not using one that is just straight, looks the same as what your reference is. It's mixing references and taking bits and pieces and sort of trying to figure it out. But mm -hmm. it's also about the creative eye and what you want out of it and what direction you're going in. And I think that, yeah, yeah and unfortunately some people have it, some people don't. I don't know how much I have of it. I think I'm semi-creative but semi-technical as well. So sometimes mm. it helps to have your team. So most of the time the stylists are much more on the creative side and you mm. can sort of balance things back and don't be arrogant about it and let other people put their input in. Yeah, and help all, build it. Yeah, help build it, exactly. I mean, you can always yeah. veto things if you really don't think that's in what you're thinking but 
creative input from as many people as possible is super important. A cre- uh, collaborative work. Yeah, collaborative like we always work, exactly. We always speak about that on the show is also being more collaborative and it's allowing so people... A, a lot of people see it as criticism or kind of infringing on your territory, yeah, I think basically. It's, I mean, if you're going to go into what I do, it's, it's a collaboration, end of story. If mm. you try to hold it to your own sort of creative thing, it will never work. Um, my, like somebody was... People were asking me, you use a retoucher. You're mm-hmm. giving some of your creative, you know, input over to somebody else. How can you do that? And I was like, my whole thing is a collaboration. The stylist is doing their job. The makeup artist is doing their job. I'm not, it's not my work in total. It's mm-hmm. everyone's work together. And giving that part of the retoucher, I keep the grading because I think that is quite creative and quite a part of my sort of thing is the way I use color. But then afterwards, for the retouching, the skin retouching, giving it to someone who's probably better than me, actually, and they specialize in it is, I think, a better thing. It's not taking away from my creative thing and giving my work over and letting somebody else sort of draw on top of it, as people think. Mm. It's really about working with these people together and getting it all to go. And if they've got a similar vision to you, then it's actually not a problem. It works more in your favor. You kind of have to 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 mood board and to get them on the same sort of thing. And it's it's also about that's why I use the same retoucher. Only use one. We've been working together for a long time because you sort of get your sort of stride with them and mm. backwards and forwards until you know what both of you want. And I um, mean, well, what what you want to get out of it, and she sort of understands it, and it's it's a bit of work to get it for you both to be on the same path. Mm. And then, yeah, that's the thing with me and teams. Once you find good teams, especially in this country, actually, it's difficult. So once you find good good team members, and you try to specify them specifically, use them for what they're good at, but good good team members are hard to come by, and it takes also years to build that, mm, and to build the nice. trust, and yeah. Also, their personalities on set. If they could be amazing what they do, and if their personality is not great on set, people are going to be unhappy. Client mm-hmm. might be unhappy. They might become miserable, and it just it's this. It's such a delicate. The day on set is such a strenuous, delicate thing that everything needs to sort of be right. And also with the client on set too, which ninety percent of the time is what's happening. Client is on set. Yeah, most of the time. How do you deal with a client now? Is on set, you shooting, you've mood boarded, you've done everything, and they've said to you, they've just gone like, "Can we change this and this and this?" You got to roll the punches. It's just that's what it is. Uh, I got to shoot a lingerie shoot from Estonia without a client on set, and that was amazing. But it's happened probably once, maybe twice in ten years. Mm. You have to just roll with what what they say and sometimes you have designers and other people on set that change things as well and everyone wants to put their two cents in but a lot of the time those people haven't been in the meetings leading up to this so they're a yes. bit they don't understand what everyone is you know uh, like striving to you know to accomplish they just put their two cents into what they think in that second so you got to roll with it sometimes you sort of brush it off or you you kind of, a lot of the time I find, and I, I know other people also say it, is you kind of let, if the person says, why don't we try this hat, for instance, and you know, okay, we don't want hats because this is a, you know, it's not that kind of a shoot. You kind of put the hat in and you let them see that it's not working and you let them see that everyone else is a bit like, hmm, this is not really working. And then you move on. And it's just something, it's, you know, you against the clock, but you just have to sort of, do that to sort of get that, let that person have their say and move on. Otherwise, the whole time they'll be trying to push the hat in the shoot and it becomes worse. So you have to roll the punches. You have to do that and you have to let them see for themselves that it's not working, even though you know it's not going to work. And client trust is a huge thing because yeah. only after that period of time, let's say the 10-year period, will they be happy to not come on site with you, allow you to shoot off the brief? Not even. <laughs> you know, that's like yeah. kind of a fantasy, but... Uh, it, it gets better. The first time is always difficult, and then it, they, yeah, they start to trust you over time. So that's why I'm happy I get to work with people many times. It's not like I'm, you know, jumping ship all the time, because yeah, you got to build the trust, and then people will trust you, and you kind of work together, and there's less um, people pulling their own ways. So which is great. Mm. But yeah, as I said, that does take time, and and they have to see that you can deliver. That's yes. the main thing. Yes, Once you've you... deliver, then the first time, then they kind of relax quite a lot to the second time and yeah. then it's, it's easier and they stop trying to pull then it's more like they'll stop they won't be as aggressive in their in their 
you know, they would ask, hey, why don't we try this instead of like, this should be like that. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they're not right either. I mean, they're hiring me to do something that they can't do. So They need to um, trust that. They need to trust yeah. that. And it's a difficult thing. And some people can let go easier than other people. Mm. I mean, the only thing that a new client has to base it on is a portfolio. And potentially, it's a scary thing if you think about it. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of rands that they are. Um, they take a huge risk. I mean, if, especially if they work for big companies. They're taking a couple hundred thousand rand of the company's money and they're saying, we're entrusting it to this guy to do a good job. If I mess it up, they're also in trouble. So, so I can understand why they're on edge until mm. they see the final product. Mm -hmm. so. And you spoke about like the before part. What about that after part? Because you also mentioned there is no one speaks about the before and the after. Yeah, What's the, the after, after? The after is all the issues that come with the post-production and the things that you've missed on the day or you didn't see that there was a pin in the hem or something like that to take out and also client realizing that oh they needed this and oh they needed that but they didn't tell you in the start so it's a bit of a scramble to sort of get that sometimes you have to tell them listen unfortunately we didn't do it because it wasn't mm. in the brief or whatever because mm. a lot of time when they actually action the, the pictures into their campaigns and stuff they realize oh actually we needed this and Sometimes you can make a plan and Photoshop things in or, or take things out, and other times they just have to change the idea a bit. But it's, it's a lot of backwards and forwards, and obviously they want the pictures tomorrow. Mm. And there's a lot of, I mean, just going through editing. To edit down, I mean, my last shoot the other day, we shot a day and a half, which is not normal. Normally we shoot at least always full days. But we had to wait for a, a racing car, so we had to get another half day. We shot 2,500 images. To now sit through and go from two and a half, we went from two and a half thousand images to 500 images. I work with a, my digital assistant, which is Susie, also my girlfriend, luckily. But it's, it's hours and hours and hours of narrowing down images to the best ones. I mean, shooting, yeah, I did shoot quite a lot. Uh, you try actually going back to shooting film helps you stop shooting two and a half thousand images, but it's very easy. But, it, but at this point, we had eight guys. Um, working on a car they were all like a pit crew and eight male models on a day that was a bit warm wearing helmets and gloves which they yeah. were and full suits they get a bit like oh it's warm and then in between shots they take gloves off and then they don't forget they forget to put them back on and then that that cuts out that shot so that shot we can't use because the one out of the eight guys is not wearing his gloves or they had visors and they would put their visors up because it's hot and then one guy would have his visor up and then that kills that shot so it, that's why I was shooting two and a half thousand images you got to go through and look at each of the eight guys and narrow down that takes hours and client doesn't really understand that mm -hmm. I actually sometimes sit with client and go through there well I narrow it down we narrowed it down to 500 and then you sit with someone and you go through 500 images and they realize how cumbersome that is mm -hmm. I think that kind of slowly slowly they start to realize that you can't have it the next day and you push time over and then retouching and fixing all those issues that also takes time and it's backwards and forwards and changes. Yeah, it's a lot of and work. And that's a lot of work and a lot of communicating with clients and hopefully clients around to actually answer these questions that they want because they know what it needs, yeah. what needs to be done. And that there's a lot of work in that. And that's where I think a lot of people fall short. So you've done this great shoot, you've done the great pre production, and then it comes to post production and you're a bit over it and ready to move on to the next thing. But you need to, to supply that service to the client. And that's where a lot of people actually get angry with a client because they do sometimes ask for silly things, but you just have to do it. And that's where I think a lot of people lose. I know some video guys that I've worked with, they've lost the client because when it comes to the editing, they get a bit irritated and clients messing around because clients do that. But you just mm -hmm. got to, you got to just, just it's going to yeah. always be like that. And it always has been yeah. like that. There's so. nothing you can do about all the reverts that come back. You know, you can try and mitigate that in your budgets and yeah. make sure that you've compensated. And you say that you will have three revisions and yes. then it will be, you know, charged, which is fine. And they, they still will do it. Yeah. And they they'll will, still do five or however many. And, and they, then they realize that they've got to pay. And hopefully that just narrows it. I mean, stops them going crazy. But still, it's going to happen. And that is when... I think a lot of people lose their client because the client then, the last dealings they have with them, they've been left with a bitter taste in their mouth. So when it comes to the next shoot, they were like, hmm, the end and trying to get the images or the video and trying to, you know, sort of wrap it up was so terrible. And I had so, got so much flack that I actually rather not deal with this person. And that's where the, the, the 10 o'clock, oh, I've actually literally had 
we need this picture done by mm. 10 o'clock tonight because tomorrow is being printed. And it actually was printed four meters in front of a store the next day, and I went and saw it. So sometimes those things happen, and you've got to ra- rise to the mm. occasion, or they're not going to use you. And that's where it matters. When you drop them, when they need that image to be printed the next day, that could literally you know, lose the client. You could lose the client from that. Mm. That's the thing is you've got to, as I say, you've got to be good in the pre, on the day, and in the post. And that's the full service, and it's however long it takes, and that's just it. Yeah, and it's, not, it's never easy. And it's the going over and beyond that the client will appreciate and want to work with you again. And that's where I retain clients and, well, you know, when they phone me like, listen, I need, I need help, you need to give me this image by 10 o'clock, I make it happen, and that's... That's what makes me stand out from the rest of the people who are like, oh, no, I don't have time for this, sorry. So. Yeah, and, that, and that attitude is not an uncommon attitude in the creative industry. I mean, in yeah, any industry so, anyway, but yeah. we know we're talking in the creative industry. So many creatives are quick to say, like, get rid I, of the client. I get angry. A lot of the time I, I get so, uh, um, my studio partners hear me ranting and raving almost every day. But you just, you know, rant, let it out, and you... You just get back to doing. You never rant to the client. That's no. the thing. Yeah, you, you got to wait till you calm down before replying yes. to emails and stuff yes. like that. It's, it's you got to be professional. Exactly, and they are under pressure. You're under pressure. They're under huge pressure, and Massive. the stuff that those big companies put their staff through is crazy. And then it is. it's irritating to you, but for them, it's literally like their their job above, depends ab- on it. Yeah, above yeah. them, and then they'll those corporate companies are so intense that people are waiting for everyone else to slip up. So yeah. you've got to be there to help them and you've got to be their partner to help them. And in that way, they'll want to use you in future because yes. they know that they can depend on you. The same with me and stylists and makeup artists. If I've had makeup artists before a job at 8 o'clock at night saying, oh, I'm not coming tomorrow. And then I'm like, well, what am I going to do now? I've got to you know, phone and beg people to come tomorrow to help me out. And I won't work with those people again because I know that they're not... They're not reliable. I can't trust them and I can't rely on them to... I'm under huge pressure the night before and the days before organizing all these things. And there's always things that go wrong. And when everything's going wrong and, and then someone phones you and says, well, I'm not coming tomorrow for no good reason, you're just like, well, screw you then. I'm not going to use you in the future. And then they phone me after saying, hey, why aren't you using me? You know, why aren't we working together? And it's just like, you know, you can answer that question for yourself. And it's the same thing with you and the client. When you then client phones you and you know asks you for a favor and you don't you just like oh, I couldn't be bothered or irritating, then they're gonna you know when the next year comes along they're not gonna wanna it's gonna be the same. Yeah, they're gonna look so somewhere I think else. That is the important thing. You need to follow through all the way to the end, and that's the only way to retain clients. Mm. It's very hard to get in the door, but I think a lot of people can get in the door, but they can't. They don't follow up and they don't retain clients, and that's the thing. I struggle. Because I'm not very aggressive in my approach to get in the door. But once I'm in the door, I keep clients. There's very few clients that I haven't retained, other than it being a budget or some other reason. But never from, oh, I just don't like working with that person. Mm, which is I always, pride myself on that. It's, it's very important. That and there's not that many clients to, in this country that you can just mess up and jump ship and get another client and then you know if you do that within like a year or two you'll be out of options yeah so i think it's it's a very bad habit and a bad way to look at it and what about keeping up with um technology changes in the equipment although we're not talking exactly about settings or specifics no uh, it's important it's important to understand what you what what kind of work you're doing and what kind of gear you need for that work there's no point in going out and buying the best stuff when you really don't need it so like wedding photographers going out and buying crazy sen- huge sensor cameras to shoot billboards. It's, it's not going to be used for that. But in my case, I am shooting, you know, some of the, I think the Mall of Africa, I think it's eight meter size print in the window. So I need to have, I had to go now and buy the new Nikon D850 with almost 50 megapixel sensor because it needs to be printed that big and it needs to have that quality. So you need to keep up with that. Even though the, the last cameras I was using were, were fine, but this one, I actually had it the other day. The client wanted to crop about 20% of the picture out. And if you don't have the megapixel, the, the right sizes, when you crop that out and you want to print it eight meters big, it's going to be pixelated and look terrible. 
So mm-hmm. they are, oh, you need to keep up with technology and you need to have these things so that when client does pull some ridiculous thing, which is always going to happen, you can at least compensate for that or you have the megapixels or whatever. Mm. But as I say, well, as I've said before, I, I shoot quite lean. So I have a lean gear set up, a camera with a lens. You don't need all like so much stuff, but, but, you, but you learn over time what you need. And when you need to, when you realize there's a need, you need to go out and, and buy those things at the exorbitant prices. That, yeah. wow, that's, exactly. You've got to do it. It's just part of, it's a cost of business. You yeah. have to run, it, this thing you need to run exactly like a business. And it's business just, advice for any creative, what is your key business advice, regardless of the genre, because business advice is business advice. Jeez, yeah, yeah, I don't know, actually. Um, never thought of that. But you have, to, you have to know about business, and you have to run it like a business, even though it's a creative thing. It's very important to be professional and business-like. And what I do is I'll speak to clients in like a, um, you know, email them or fo- speak to them on the phone about normal things in like a nice, fun, joking way. But when it comes to invoices and stuff, you have a sort of business strictness about it. You need to sort of separate your, you know, building relationships with the client and then the financial side. So the way I write an email of a, hey, how are you doing? I think we should, you know, get this model or do this or stuff um, is written in one way. And then when I say, you know, dear so-and-so, here is the invoice with the outstanding amount. You know, you have different, different sort of voices for different parts of your business. And you have to keep that business side business because dealing with freelance and, um, and money and invoices, especially in this country, is a nightmare. And you need to be very strict and business-like about it or you're going to land up in trouble with invoices that are six months old and no one paying. And, and so you don't want it to destroy your, your relationship with clients if you get stroppy about, oh, you haven't paid my invoice. So keeping that separate and keeping that very professional, I think is a good, is a very important, you know, tip on the business side. Um, what else? Uh, interesting. In terms really and conditions. Know. You know, because when yeah, you go into things. a contract in terms of terms and conditions, have you ever used any legal advice to have terms and conditions drawn up? Or have you found I that you've kind of made... Do. I kind of I kind of write things out in entirety in emails and make sure that, that, that things are written out in emails and on writing. So sometimes if you phone and then they say something and you like, and you, you write it on email or you reaffirm it, hey, listen, we're going to get this Ferrari for this much amount of money per day. Are you happy with that? And just, just make sure that before you get yourself into, um, you know, hiring something out that they don't actually want or they didn't really have budget for. It's literally have everything in writing, get them to okay it. Don't do anything until things have been okayed and said in writing. Otherwise, you can land yourself up in, you know, in a bit of troubles. But I think that's also very important. And I don't think about it, but I actually do that quite a lot. And it's always making sure, double-checking, all those things, and in writing is very important. Mm. No, it is. Do you ever get deposits for jobs? Yes, yeah. So now I work with... Um, I've been burnt once before, and uh, I now get at least 50% upfront before I do anything. Because especially when you're doing productions, you can land yourself up with huge bills that will could tank your business of like hundreds of thousands. Mm. Um, so it's, it's it's very important to to get the deposit. And some clients you work like or when I work with these big companies that I have years of history with, sometimes the deposit doesn't actually arrive before the day, which is which is a problem. And it's just unfortunately they. Sometimes they cannot do that. You shouldn't. Um, you shouldn't stop your thing about it. But but if it's a new client, I would say fifty percent deposit or or no shoot. It's kind of you have to be strict on that. Because I have heard and I've been in situations where it's become a problem. Yeah. So I think and people respect it. I actually yeah. surprisingly, I always get a bit nervous. You send that email and you think, ooh, you just had this like dance of getting to know each other and you know get this job and then you have to send this horrible like 50 percent deposit or no shoot kind of yeah but that's why i say you need to use that language in that yeah. email and fortunately for the ones where you did burn your fingers they're never huge amounts 
they always kind of learning that's when you, Yeah, that's when yeah. you, you're like, oh, it's not a big amount. Am I yeah. going to, do I really feel like sending this horrible email? Because I feel, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to separate your emotions from those things, but you need to try. Yeah, that and also comes down to the business aspect of it. Exactly. You need to be a businessman as well. That's super important. Otherwise, you won't survive. Fortunately not. <laughs> you get burned too many times. And yeah. I've heard people, especially creatives, and they want to be nice and they want to be, you know, helpful to no. clients. Because you, to get a client, you, you're excited and you want to do it. And you're willing to, you know, negotiate and drop things. But there's certain things you need to stick by. Otherwise... Yeah. might actually lose your business. At the end of the day, sometimes trying to drop the price for the client comes back to bite you because oh, yeah, you land sure. up doing already on what you've costed. You always land up doing more than what you've costed. It's just natural. Uh, yeah, like there's it's always, a, always things. Yeah. I do have little things that I add in here and there, like a little bit to sort of compensate for that because there's always things that you don't see that come up. Or sometimes with certain clients, they allow you to sort of send a second invoice with all those things. But they do. I mean, it always arises. Mm. But you learn with, with experience. You learn yeah, that's the thing. where those things are and how to sort of mitigate mm. them and work around them or, or compensate great. for it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. And just to wrap up the show, we always end with something sort of random and we ask you a random question or I Uh-oh. ask you a random question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's usually fun. So my random question to you is... Because you have an Italian background, yeah. we know Italians love food. I mean, my stepfather's Italian, so yeah. I know all about that. What is your favorite food? I was actually thinking about this last night. Definitely, I'm growing up in his Italian. I would, would say Italian food and father's cooking. But I also love Japanese food. Oh, really? Yeah. What is your favorite meal there? Um, well, I mean, of course, I love the the sushi side of it and went to Obi mm. which is in Loop Street I think is the most sort of traditional Japanese food and most of it actually there's actually not much of it that I don't like I really mm. love it so uh, that's why I'm planning a trip to go to Japan hopefully in a couple of years we'll see that's like next on the list because the food is number one reason is to go have the food in Japan we'll see how close ours is to that most people would say pizza Actually, pizza is not one of my favorites. Really, there's certain pastas that are. I love Amatriciana, which is from where my fa- the area my family's from, and Bolognese, my father's one, which is different to most. Ours is more tomatoey than the real one. The real mm. one's a bit drier, but that's home cooking and grandfather's gnocchi and when he was still alive and those things. I mean, they always are the best comfort food, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah, also love Japanese, which I don't tell my dad. <laughs> <laughs> sake, red wine, sake. alcohol. Whiskey and sake. Japanese whiskey as well is amazing. Oh, I haven't had that. It's really good. Don't tell the Scots. <laughs> <laughs> we won't let them hear the show. We'll yeah. just like tag. I think the but... Japanese won best whiskey in the world for the first time beating the Scots. Wow. It was last year or a couple of years ago. And I've got to try some yeah. Japanese whiskey. I have some at home. You can come try. Thank you. <laughs> couple of bottles. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to take you up on that. Oh, sure. So I'd like to wrap up the show. I'd like to say thank you to Danny so much for your time and cool. being in front of the camera, not behind it. We know it's not your favorite. Yeah, not my favorite thing. But no, but you, right. you've done a great job and we didn't ask you to model or have to thank turn God. to the side or flex a muscle. So no. <laughs> we appreciate that. Cool. And Thanks I think the me. knowledge that you had to share is very valuable. And I'd also yeah. like to say thank you to the listeners because we can't produce the show without the interest in the show. And really, we're doing it for the creatives. And I don't want to say we're doing it just for South African creatives, but there's nothing like this being done for South African creatives. True. There's no digital mentorship program for them that they can tune into. It's not just that this episode is relevant for photographers or that mm-hmm. another episode we did uh, with, let's say, law or animation is relevant just for that genre. Yeah. If an individual listens to the show, it's holistic. It provides them with a very good good all-rounded approach to business, work ethic, creativity, and really pushing beyond the boundaries of their own fear and doing something that they feel passionate about and we feel passionate about. It's great that we have finally a local thing because I watch things and listen to things and it's all overseas and talking with their law and their money, it's it's, it's completely different. Yeah, and it doesn't relate to There's some that does, some parts of it that does and other parts not at all. Now, obviously, Americans are different to us and... Totally different. Europeans. And, and so we have our own 
ways of doing things here. So it's important. I, I think it's very important. And I just want to say thanks. Share it, like it, and tell another creative sitting next to you at the office or a friend about the show because we want to educate, inform, and inspire. High five.